Wind and Power students, Dr. John Schrage here, and I'm getting you started on what's a very long lecture about weather systems. Um, this was a really hard PowerPoint for me to make and presentation for me to figure out what to do because all of these kinds of topics that we're going to be working on in this lecture, things like mid-latitude cyclones and anticyclones, jet streams, hurricanes, monsoons, well, heck, you could have a whole course about any of those topics. In fact, many of those topics I've taught whole courses about. I mean, it's a little bit hard to sort of take a look at this and say, yeah, if I had about 20 minutes, what would I tell you about a hurricane? Or if I had about 20 minutes, what would I tell you about monsoons? I mean, it's kind of just a little narrow, it's just a little glimpse as to what these systems are all about. On the other hand, um, if you looked at the book, you saw that that's actually kind of been their challenge, too. I mean, they have, like, three paragraphs about cyclones or two pages about jet streams or something like that. Well, that's hardly a, much of an understanding of what's going on, but it's probably enough for the purposes of, like, us being able to use those terms in a class about wind power. I mean, I want to be able to use words like a cyclone or the jet stream, and we at least know what we're talking about. So in the first part of this lecture, we're going to be working on mid-latitude cyclones and anti-cyclones. Keyword here is that mid-latitude part of it there. Um, we're going to see later in this lecture that hurricanes and typhoons are examples of tropical cyclones. Mid-latitude means like not in the tropics and not at the pole or a region, but kind of at the kind of latitudes where Omaha is. Mid-latitude cyclones are synoptic scale areas of low pressure. By synoptic scale, we mean it's, you know, hundreds to a few thousand, a few hundred to maybe a thousand kilometers wide. It covers an area typically the size of several United States states, and it's an area of low pressure, so I've drawn it here on this map so that it has some isobars around it. Maybe uh, the pressure around the mid-latitude cyclone is like 1,010, 1,015 millibars, but then as you get closer and closer towards the center of it, the pressure is lower. Just to give you a sense, a typical pressure in a mid-latitude cyclone might be something like 1,000 millibars. It's a few millibars lower than the pressure of the average at the surface. Uh, what I do want you to be clear about here is that mid-latitude cyclones are not tornadoes, they are not hurricanes, they are not dust devils. All of those kinds of things, sometimes in our popular understanding, we use the word cyclone to describe them. I mean, Iowa State, their logo is that they're the cyclones, and they have a tornado as part of their logo. Okay, uh... I guess it would look really boring if they had a mid-latitude cyclone as their uh, as their their, uh, their logo or their uh, mascot for their school or something. But those things are not cyclones, okay? They are these big synoptic scale weather systems. They're migratory. In other words, they move. They last about a week. We'll see a lot about them in the uh, rest of this lecture here. Mid-latitude cyclones can be either at the surface, in, well let's say in the boundary layer, or they could be up at, uh, uh, in the free atmosphere. In fact, a better way to put that is the whole system is part, I mean, the, the mid-latitude cyclone has parts that are in the boundary layer and there are parts that are in the free atmosphere. Um, it might be easier to talk about the parts, you know, the way it's structured in the free atmosphere first, because remember, if we talk about the free atmosphere, the flow can be described or at least well approximated as being geostrophic. We can take our map that I had there of this mid-latitude cyclone, and I can put some air parcels there in blue just to sort of illustrate some places there. And I know that if I'm approximating the flow as being geostrophic, the flow is going to be parallel to the isobars with low pressure to its left and high pressure to the right of the flow. So I can take those four locations there around the map, and I can at each of them figure out what direction the wind should be, parallel to the isobars, low pressure to the left of the flow, high pressure to the right of the flow. And what you see is that the flow is going around the mid-latitude cyclone in a way that is counterclockwise. It will be counterclockwise anyway in the northern hemisphere. In fact, if you worked all this through for the southern hemisphere, it would be the other way around. But we're not doing southern hemisphere meteorology in this class. All right, well, I can kind of see what's going on. Oh, I see. The cyclone has this uh, counterclockwise or cyclonic flow around it. The adjective is cyclonic flow around it. But what I want you to understand is the flow is not twirling. You know, like as in like a tornado or a dust devil or something like that. In fact, go online and you'll see all kinds of nifty demos or whatever, like this one I'm showing you right here, uh, where we see, um, you know, the flow going round and round and round like that. That's not what's going on in a cyclone. The cyclone's entire life might only be a few days, and these winds are only a few miles per hour. I mean, I don't know, maybe 10 miles per hour, 15 miles per hour. Well, that's that that 
complete orbit, if you would, around that path around the mid-latitude cyclone is, I'm sure, thousands of miles. There just isn't time. An air parcel is not going to make even one full pass all the way around the cyclone. In fact, it'll only make it maybe a quarter to a third of the way around or something like that over the course of the life cycle of the mid-latitude cyclone. So don't get the idea that it's sitting there spinning. It's turning, but really quite slowly. Now, let's see what we can do different with these mid-latitude cyclones if we're talking about a situation near the surface of the Earth, like in the Ekman layer, where we need to take friction into account. Well, we've already seen in the Ekman layer winds lecture what winds in the Ekman layer should look like. They should be almost parallel to the isobars. They should still have low pressure to their left of the flow and higher pressure to the right of the flow, in the northern hemisphere anyway. And they should, the flow should be crossing the isobar slightly towards the area of low pressure, um, you know, maybe like a 20 or 30 degree angle or something like that. And so if I do that, take my four grid points, uh, four uh, air parcels rather, that I had on, the, on that mid-latitude cyclone there, and I think about which way the Ekman layer winds should be, I can draw my little vectors there, and um, I see that the winds are still rotating in a counterclockwise way down here near the surface of the winds, uh, near the surface. Um, but actually, if we kind of drew some arrows in there to help visualize this, I want you to see that the winds are not just going around the mid-latitude cyclone, they're also kind of spiraling in towards the center. As the winds are crossing the isobars at a, at a, sh a shallow angle, admittedly, they are spiraling in towards the center of the mid-latitude cyclone. This only happens near the surface, like in the boundary layer, and it's only because we're taking friction into account we have those Goldberg moan winds, to use the correct meteorological term for it. That is a, quant a, a phenomenon. There is a, something going on here where air is coming together at the surface. We call it convergence. Anytime horizontal winds are coming together, the right word for that is convergence. It's actually a mathematical quantity. In fact, I originally had the equation up here, but we're not going to do that. At least not at this point in the course. We're going to be talking, though, about how like, air that is coming together is converging. The, at the surface, the cyclone is an area of convergence. So, um, mid-latitude cyclones are areas of convergence in the lower you know, like atmosphere, like in the boundary layer. Whereas, not up in the free atmosphere. In fact, if I put those two slides again side by side like that, you can see how down in the uh, boundary layer, which is the top slide, we see how the flow is crossing isobars headed towards the center of the area of low pressure, whereas in the free atmosphere, which is the lower of the two slides there, you can see how the flow is parallel to the isobars and there's no convergence going on. With that information in hand, it starts being a whole lot easier to understand what's going on in an anticyclone. Anticyclones are synoptic scale regions of high pressure. So again, we're expecting this to be an area where the pressure is a little bit higher than the long-term average. Uh, over an area about the size of several United States states, and it's going to last, you know, probably about a week or so. It's going to move, it's, it's migratory, to use the right adjective there. Oh, well, how high is the pressure in an anticyclone? Maybe 1,030 millibars or something like that. So since the average pressure at the surface of the Earth is about 1,013 millibars, yeah, it's a little bit higher than that. Anticyclones are these areas of high pressure, and we can see them at the surface or in the boundary layer, as well in the free atmosphere. You know, the phenomenon can extend up to different levels of the atmosphere here. And again, it's very much easier to first start by thinking about up in the free atmosphere, where we can make the approximation that these features are being well described by geostrophic flow conditions. We can make the geostrophic approximation here where we're going to be saying again that the flow is parallel to the isobars with lower pressure to its left and higher pressure to its right. So I can take my map here with these isobars on it, and I could sit there and take my four air parcels that I've got on there, and I could think through my forces there, and I would realize that I get a wind that are parallel to the flow, and in fact the flow is clockwise as it goes around that anticyclone, that area of high pressure. Okay, clockwise in the northern hemisphere, but let's just not stress the southern hemisphere right now. But again, I want to emphasize this anticyclone is not sitting there twirling. Again, in its entire lifetime of like a week or so, you know, this whole thing is only going to have rotated maybe a third of the way around or something like that. This is not sitting there and just spinning like a, like a merry-go-round in the park or something like that. That was in the free atmosphere. Let's see what the same thing looks like down near the surface, like in the Ekman layer, where we have to take friction into account, where our flow will be almost parallel to the isobars. 
It will still have low pressure to its left and higher pressure to its right, but remember it's crossing the isobars at a shallow angle, maybe 30 degrees or something like that, from higher pressure towards lower pressure. And in fact, if I take my four points there and I, oh, I do the vectors and I think it all through, I end up with winds that look something like those little arrows on there. And again, you'd see that the flow is clockwise around the anticyclone in the northern hemisphere. But now it is, again, with some arrows that might be helpful there, the flow is has this characteristic also of it spiraling out of the center of the anticyclone. The area of the center of the anticyclone, if you could follow air parcels from the center, you'd see that they're radiating out in all directions as they spiral away from the center of the anticyclone. And there's a powerful mathematical term for that. That's divergence. Again, divergence or divergence, can be pronounced either way, um, is a mathematical quantity. And again, I had the equation on here and then decided, no, we can wait with that. Um, but it is something we can measure. We can actually quantify how much divergence is going on at these locations here. So much like cyclones were areas of convergence in the boundary layer, anticyclones are areas of divergence in the boundary layer. But just like cyclones were not areas of convergence in the free atmosphere, Anticyclones are not areas of divergence in the free atmosphere, and again, you can see that on these two diagrams right here. Now, to understand what that means for weather, I need to try to show you this with maybe a little bit more of a perspective here. So what I did here is I took, actually from an intro textbook here, kind of a little schematic diagram that just sort of shows the flow around an anticyclone on the left and a cyclone on the right. And so you can see the area of high pressure on the map uh, on the left and then area of low pressure on the right. And you can see how the flow at the surface is clockwise around the anticyclone and counterclockwise around the, the cyclone. And you can see how the area of uh, the anticyclone is experiencing divergence as the flow flows away from the high. And you can see how the area of, of low pressure is an area of convergence that's happening. Don't worry about the vertical arrows there just yet. But now, I'm just going to put up some like road signs here. So if those cyclone is an area of convergence and the anticyclone is an area of divergence, you might think that that would tell you something interesting about the density and how the density is changing. I mean, take a look at that cyclone over there that I have circled in red. You would think that inside of that circle there, we're going to be continually bringing in more mass of air as air spirals in towards the inside of that circle, towards the center of the cyclone. So you would think that that means that, the let's see, if density is the mass per unit volume, well, if we're bringing in more mass to the same volume, it seems like density should be going up. And similarly, if you look in that blue circle there around the anticyclone on the left, you might think that that would mean that the density has to start decreasing inside of that blue circle there. Because you would start, you would think, I'm taking mass that was around the center of that anticyclone and I'm taking it away from the center of the anticyclone. Since density is mass per unit volume, it might seem like that means that the density has to be going down, but actually it doesn't really work that way. Because air is effectively incompressible by horizontal winds. This is something, the fancy schmancy term, which I believe your book does drop at one point someplace along the way, is the Boussinesque approximation. I can't remember who Boussinesque was, but the Boussinesque approximation tells us that when air converges, it doesn't get like crushed. If for all intents and purposes, the air is incompressible from this horizontal wind perspective. Um, you can figure that out for yourself by just thinking about like squeezing a basketball or squeezing a soccer ball. Okay, there's a certain amount of air in there and, you know, it's probably physically possible to crush the soccer ball and make the air inside there more dense, but you're not strong enough to do it. Same with like a basketball, you're not strong enough to crush the thing. The winds aren't that strong either. The winds can't cr take a soccer ball and crush it by convergence. Uh, the air is effectively incompressible with respect to horizontal winds. We'll see vertical, it's all a different story. So instead, if you're near the surface where there's convergence happening in the center of that cyclone in the, uh, on the right there, the air, if it's incompressible, as the air comes together, as it converges near the center of that cyclone, there's no place for the air to go but up. It can't go down into the ground. It's converging near the center. The only place to go is up. Similarly, at the anticyclone over there on the left-hand side of the screen, as air spirals away from the center of the area of high pressure, you can't just keep pulling air away and air away and eventually have a vacuum there or something like that. More air has to replace it by sinking from above. So the 
air is sinking into the center of the anticyclone, air is rising out of the center of the cyclone. This is a phenomenon that actually has a name in meteorology. It's called continuity. In fact, the continuity equation is one of the seven primitive equations that are about how forecasts are made. Again, at one point I actually even had the equation on here, but we don't need it right now. Um, but this idea that there is continuity in the Earth's atmosphere, you can't just crush the air and make it disappear. Um, you have to, if you're going to squeeze it from the sides, you have to make it come out the top. Horizontal convergence and divergence are going to be resulting in vertical motion in the atmosphere. I remember when I took dynamic meteorology way back when, 1991 probably, um, my professor, Dr. Zapotochny, called this the tube of toothpaste theorem. You squeeze it from the sides and it comes out the top. Okay? You, you, you have convergence, there's no place for the air to go but up, at least at the surface. In fact, that's what I'm illustrating here on the bottom right corner of the screen. We have a little cross-section of this weather pattern here. See how air is converging near the surface, rising motion, and then air is diverging up near the tropopause. The tropopause is kind of like a ceiling or a lid to the weather. So we'll learn more why later in a future module, but not right now. So if air comes together at the surface, converges, there's going to be rising motion and then upper level divergence. There's actually the opposite pattern, which is possible too. You can have upper level convergence right below the tropopause. There's no place for the air to go but down, because air won't go through the tropopause. It's like a ceiling or a lid. And then when it hits the surface, there's no place for the air to go but out. It diverges. So you get convergence at the loft, sinking motion, and low-level divergence. Both of those things are well described by, again, the so-called continuity equation, which we are not going to see at this time. The property here is called continuity. And so you can get pattern weather patterns that look like either of those two things here. You can have features that have convergence at the surface, rising motion, and upper level divergence, like what I show on the right, or you can have upper level convergence, sinking motion, and low level divergence, like what I have on the right. Now, the horizontal winds are not going to be able to ch result in changes in the density of the air, but vertical motions do. As air rises, it encounters air that is at a lower pressure than it is around it, and the air in the air parcel expands. And expanding, well, if you change the uh, amount of mass per unit volume, that means the density is going to go down. So anytime air rises, it expands, and it, um, it's going to be doing the opposite of be compressing while it sinks. And so, again, we are not at that point yet to understand exactly why, but whenever air is rising and expanding, you're going to get clouds forming. So, in general, again, if you've had intro to meteorology or something like that, you learned quite a bit about that already. But anytime air is rising, you get clouds and precipitation and so on. So, cyclones tend to be areas of cloudiness and precipitation, whereas anticyclones, areas of high pressure, tend to be areas of clear conditions and fair weather. Now, I don't want you to get the idea, though, that, like, the way I have it drawn here, where like air is squirting up in the center of the, uh, in the exact center of the cyclone or something like that, or like the air is somehow squirting down in the center of the anti-cyclone right there. Rather, the whole area of the, of the cyclone is going to be a favorable location to get vertical motion. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get uh, vertical motion in clouds everywhere inside of the cyclone. Nor does it actually mean that like you're going to get sinking motion and, and no clouds whatsoever any place in the anticyclone over there on the left, but there is a favorable condition to get rising motion all over the place in the, in the cyclone. There's favorable conditions to get uh, sinking motion pretty much all over the place in uh, the anticyclone. So the low-level divergence and sinking motion are happening, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> they have a misspell there. So the low-level divergence of the sinking motion are happening everywhere in the anticyclone uh, over there on the left. In fact, that's kind of an interesting insight into what's going on here. Um, if you go on eBay or something like that and you want to buy a barometer, the instrument that measures uh, pressure, you'll get all kinds of very scientific and, and looking instruments, but you'll also get a bunch of these things. These little kind of cuckoo clock looking things that have a barometer inside of them. And the barometer is used to make a little turning motion down here that m turns this bottom part down here so that either the little old man pops out of that cuckoo clock house there or the little woman pops out. And I can't quite see how this one is made, but my great grandma always had one of these up on her wall too, where when there was high pressure, the woman would come out 
uh, you know, the, the machine would turn in such a way that the woman popped out of the house, and she had, I forget, uh, she had like a basket of laundry to hang on the line and, and had a basket of flowers or something. See, it was fair weather stuff. Whereas when the pressure was low and the barometer was reading a lower pressure, the gear turned the other way and the little old man popped out of the cuckoo clock and he had like rain boots on and an umbrella, I forget what else. Because low pressure is in general associated with stormier weather. And so, I don't know, I always think it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm a meteorologist. I spend a fair amount of time looking for barometers online and I'm always amused by these old-fashioned ones that are mixed in with the more scientific looking ones. Now... I said that the cyclone should be a generally an area that has low pressure, it should, it should have rising motion, it should have cloud cover. There's actually a kind of a characteristic shape as to what that cloud cover should look like. It is a pattern called the comma cloud. I have a picture, a satellite picture over here on the left illustrating what a comma cloud looks like. To be honest, they don't look all that much like a comma, but they are kind of a swirl of clouds. And those swirls of clouds that are synoptic scale, those are the mid-latitude cyclones that you're seeing on something like this satellite loop that shows several weeks of satellite imagery in which we're seeing those kind of swirling motions that are moving from west to east across uh, the mid-latitudes. Those are all mid-latitude cyclones. Now, what causes these mid-latitude cyclones? For that matter, what causes these anti-cyclones? Well, again, I don't know whether you had ATS-113 or not. Some students will and some students won't. If you were in ATS-113, you probably learned an awful lot about the process known as cyclogenesis. Cyclogenesis, birth of a cyclone. Genesis is birth, cyclo is the, cyclo is actually, actually a prefix that means something like snake, but it has to do with the fact that it turns. Uh, the birth of a cyclone. Um, we are not going to teach about cyclogenesis right now in this class, okay? Um, it's a complicated process that involves jet streams at the upper troposphere, it's going to involve fronts at the surface, it results in processes that cause the pressure at the surface to fall in a synoptic scale region, but what it does is this process of cyclogenesis creates an area of low pressure, or, or it can take an existing area of low pressure and make it even stronger by making the pressure even lower, and this is going to make for strong pressure gradient forces and strong winds and so on. The process of cyclogenesis happens all the time in the atmosphere. And some look at a weather map and someplace on there, cyclogenesis is happening right now. Cyclones have a life cycle. They are born, they are they experience cyclogenesis, they have different stages in their in their life, and within about four, five, six days, they start experiencing the process of cyclolysis. That's a hard word to say, cyclolysis. Lysis, L-Y-S-I-S, -S, is a Greek suffix that means like death. Okay, this is the death of a cyclone. And again, it's a little hard to just in like a 20 minute discussion of cyclones and anti-cyclones to tell you how cyclolysis works. It is again a complex process involving friction in the boundary layer and occluded fronts at the surface and a lot of things that we're just not going to learn about at this point. But the purpose of cyclolysis is it results in pressures that rise. So cyclolysis is going to tend to destroy an area of low pressure. It's going to take an area of low pressure, but start returning its pressure higher back towards the normal pressure at the surface of the Earth, which reduces the strength of the winds by reducing the strength of the pressure gradient force and so on. It's sort of the end of the story for a cyclone. And it's all perfectly natural. It's just the way things work. Cyclolysis and cyclogenesis, cyclogenesis and cyclolysis, it's just the natural order of things in the in the atmosphere in terms of how our atmosphere produces these cyclones uh, that are day-to-day -day weather. Anticyclones are a more complicated story as to how they, well, <laughs> they're, they're also a complicated story as to how they form. It's an interaction between surfaces that are very large, synoptic scale, and homogeneous where you have a large area of the surface of the Earth that all has the same properties. You can create these areas of high pressure. Um, Siberia, the cold northern parts of Russia. They're very cold and they're very dry. Um, the Gulf of Mexico. It's very warm and it's very wet. These are areas where the air can sit there and it will form an area of high pressure through complicated processes that we're not going to discuss right now. But it is going to, those regions where the air uh, is picking up, uh, is, is forming these anticyclones are called source regions. And these source regions are going to be these wide areas here. Let me just show you here. This is a map that shows some source regions of different kinds of anticyclones that affect the United States. In fact, let's use a better word. 
This particular type of anticyclone is called an air mass. Okay? An air mass is a big area, synoptic scale area of air, that has approximately uniform humidity and approximately uniform temperature and so on throughout it. Like a cold, dry air mass that came from, that formed over, say, northern Canada, where it's very cold and very dry. Northern Canada is very large and it's basically homogeneous. It's all the same cold and dry conditions. Air sits there for a period of days and it becomes an area of high pressure that is an air mass with cold and dry conditions throughout. In contrast, like uh, over the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean, you can get air masses or anticyclones that are maritime and tropical. Maritime is our weird word in meteorology that means like wet. Okay, Wet and uh, warm. So the air masses that form over like the Gulf of Mexico with these big extensive areas of warm and moist air. And you can see that there's places where we get maritime polar or cold and wet air. And there's areas where we get continental tropical air, which is hot and dry and so on. And these air masses are going to be our anticyclones. As these air masses form, they develop higher and higher pressure. Generally speaking, anticyclones are air masses and they move. We aren't quite yet ready to know why they move, but they move. Anticyclones move. And as they move, they kind of jostle each other and try to push each other out of the way. The hot, dry air mass coming off of northern Mexico might start trying to push the warm, moist air coming off the Gulf of Mexico out of the way. And as they push each other out of the way, there's a boundary between them. Okay, there's, the, there's a line you could draw on a map that is the leading edge of one air mass as it pushes the other air mass out of the way. We do draw such lines. They're called fronts. Now, if you're a survivor of ATS-113, you learned, oh my gosh, there's like five different kinds of fronts and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're not going all that direction here, but you do know two terms really easily, warm front and cold front. A Warm front is any time where that boundary represents a place where a warmer air mass is pushing a colder air mass out of the way. Now, uh, that boundary, which is usually drawn as a red line with those red semicircles on it, is the boundary where the warm air mass, here I'll put that label on there, is pushing a colder air mass out of its way. Most of the time the warmer air mass will kind of, because warm air is less dense, it will largely just sort of slide over the top of a colder air mass. These air masses, remember, are like synoptic scale. They're hundreds of kilometers across, okay? And in this case, you can kind of see how the warmer air mass, oh, it's slightly pushing the colder air mass out of the way, but it's mostly kind of just slipping on top of it because, well, it's lighter than the cold, dense air underneath it. Cold fronts, on the other hand, are kind of the opposite thing. Anytime you have a boundary between two air masses and the colder one is pushing the warmer one out of the way, we call that boundary between the two air masses a cold front. And that front is usually drawn as a blue line with uh, blue triangles on it. And it is pushed, it represents where the colder, denser air is pushing the warmer air mass out of the way. So these are just the boundaries, the leading edges of these air masses as they push each other out of the way. So like if I just stole a weather map from of all god awful places, the, the weather channel, and I took a look at this weather map from this day. I see I have an area of high pressure centered over western Nebraska, and there's lots of isobars drawn around it to show me that that's a big old anti-cyclone there. And now that we've talked about cyclones and anti-cyclones, you can even picture how the winds are rotating in a clockwise manner around that anti-cyclone and so on. That's going to be like a cold, dry air mass from uh, Canada or something like that. Meanwhile, it's a little bit off the edge of the map there, but there's like a warm, moist air mass that's down over the Gulf of Mexico or something at this time. And that blue line with the teeth on it, that, those little triangles up there are called teeth, which is a cool term, represents the leading edge of that cold air mass as it starts pushing that warmer air mass out of the way. Great. Hey, by the way, notice that on that same map here, we've got a warm front, too, drawn as that warm, uh, that red line with the red semicircular teeth on it. And that is where the warmer air mass that's over like the southeast United States and, and the Atlantic and so on is pushing a colder air mass out of the way uh, up around the Great Lakes and Maine and so on. Notice the cyclone, the area of low pressure? It's right there on those fronts. That is not a coincidence. That's where cyclones happen. Cyclones happen on the fronts. The fronts are the boundaries between the anticyclones. See, and look what the cyclone is doing. As we have that cyclone sitting there, feel free to put some arrows around it to show that it's got this cyclonic or counterclockwise rotation. 
And you can see that it is, as it rotates, it is what is moving these high pressure systems, the anticyclones around. On the west side of the cyclone, we are dragging the cold air to the south. And on the east side of the cyclone, we are dragging the warm air to the north. The cyclone is what's doing the work. The, the, the anticyclones are just being pushed around. The cyclones are pushing the cold and warm air masses around, the boundaries between which are the fronts. In fact, cyclones will pretty much always exist along fronts, okay? Um, whereas the anticyclones are what the fronts are separating. And you can kind of get a sense of that on this uh, little inset map that I have right here, where you can see on this map here, we got a kind of a long string of cold and warm front, in general, separating colder air masses from the north from warmer air masses from the south. The high pressure systems are the air masses, the cyclones happen along the front. As I've said a couple times before, the cyclones and the anticyclones that we're learning about here are all migratory features. They are, they go through a life cycle, they move, they will last, uh, they'll move probably a few thousand kilometers over the course of their lifetime, which is maybe a week or so. They are weather. When you are learning about, you know, that, oh, you watch the weather and they tell you that tomorrow uh, there's going to be a change in the weather and it's going to get colder and there's a chance of light rain and, oh, but by later this week it's going to warm up and stuff. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about the passage of cyclones and anticyclones. I wish I could tell you more about cyclones and anticyclones right now, but we can't. We only have about 20 minutes or so that we can talk about these things at this point. Let's answer a couple questions before we move on to part two. Question one. In the northern hemisphere, we expect a cyclone to be an area of blank rotation and, near the surface, blank. Clockwise or counterclockwise rotation, convergence or divergence near the surface. Which of those describes what a cyclone in the northern hemisphere is doing? All right, make a choice from those four options and get a little feedback before you move on to question two.